That's a powerful song. How many of y'all want revival? How many of y'all ready for the spirit to come? How many of y'all ready for a change and you're ready to see, man, that you can prophesy like it is done? You can begin walking in the promises of God. How many of y'all ready for that tonight? How many of y'all came expecting that tonight? Because if you didn't come expecting, you came to the wrong spot in Jesus' name. Amen? Are y'all ready for church tonight? Father God, we praise you. We thank you. We ask that you just take us away this evening as we dig into your word together as one body in fellowship. Allow us to be uh, just in your presence, God. Reveal yourself to us with revelation, and God, words that we can apply to our lives and grow in you so that we can be better reflectors to a lost world when we leave this building, God, because it's not about what's right here and what's right now. It's about us being used by you to get your will done. God, sit us down and shut us up. Open our ears and allow us to hear. Father, we ask that you begin to move tonight in a powerful and insane dynamite way. And we're not going to settle for anything less. This is recharge and we're ready for one, God. So show up and show out as we celebrate this evening in your holy name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated in Jesus' name. That's right. Jesus. Wow, that was weak. How are y'all doing this evening? Okay, three people. How are the rest of y'all doing this evening? There we go. (laughs) Hey, man, let me get my stuff ready. This thing's being funny. Technology, right? Good. Is y'all doing good? Did y'all have a good day at work? Did anyone have today off and just get to relax the whole day and do nothing? Oh, look at that. I was expecting no one, so that's amazing. Praise God for that, man. Um, I'm excited to speak tonight. Uh, I'm excited because it's December. How many of y'all excited because it's December? Yeah. How many of y'all excited? Well, why are we excited about December? Come on. Dude, look, look, look. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There was confusion there. There's literally only one answer to that question. It's Christmas. I'm going to ask you again and give you another shot. Why are we excited about December? That's the answer I expected. Amen. Yo, it is Christmas. Man, it's always nice. You see, like, the town already got the lights up, and it's getting a little bit colder. You can wear nicer clothes. And, and, and man, it's just like, it's just that, it's that time of year. Am I right? Is anyone with me? Are you all excited about Christmas? I got a better question. How many of y'all are prepared and ready for Christmas? See, that, that, that's realistic, right? That's realistic. I, I ask that because I know two Two people who have been prepared since like December 26th of last year. And they're my two oldest kids. They've been ready since like last year on the 26th. But they've done really good holding it in until about, uh, let's say, October. And I give them credit for that. I give them credit for that, right? Because you think October comes and you got Halloween. November, you got Thanksgiving. December, you got Christmas. So you're really getting into that time of year. So like what takes place is in October, man. They know when we go to the store, they're not allowed to ask for stuff. Right? Am I with you guys with me on that? We're not allowed to ask for stuff. I'm not allowed to ask for stuff. They're not allowed to ask for stuff. So no one can ask for anything. But they do something really slick. Is they'll see something they really like, and they're allowed to say that they like it. But then they say, I like this. Maybe I can get it for Christmas. I'm like, Christmas was yesterday. What are you talking about? But no, so like, you, you think about it though, like, what really begins to build that anticipation of Christmas for kids? And I think it's something that, 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 that's kind of simple is we do something totally different in December and approaching Christmas that we don't do the rest of the year is we ask a question. Do you all know what the question is? No. What do you want? That, ask your neighbor, what do you want? Okay, no, no, see, this question is, hold on, hold on, on. wait, 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 hold on, let me prep you a little bit more, because this question can go one of two ways, it can either sound sincere or sound like you want to punch somebody in the face, it's about emphasism and tone, if you say, what do you want, that's not nice, that's not nice at all, so it's, what do you want, say it, say it, what do you want, now you all feel awkward and weird, but we begin to ask people that question, it's the season of asking people, man, what do you want? What can I get you? What can, you know, and, and we don't do that here. I mean, maybe some people do. I don't hang out with them. But, we, you know, like, what do you want? I don't do that for my kids. What do you, hey, we're going to the store. What do you want? But no, we don't do that year-round. But during Christmas, man, we go to the toy. We're, you know, we're shopping at, through, uh, uh, praise God, Walmart. <laughs> and we're going to... We're going to Walmart, and we're going food shopping, so I'll take the kids over to the toy selection while Allie's getting all the groceries, and, and, and you know, normally it's like you can touch one thing on each aisle, and that's it, and, and be quiet. 
and we're going to make this go by as painless as possible. But no, now it's like, man, would you like this? Do you like that? What, do you, what can I get you for Christmas? So it, it's really that season of asking ourselves a question and other people, man, what do you want? So again, ask your neighbor, what do you want? I want enthusiasm, please. No. <laughs> but not, not, so look, look, so look, I'm going to ask you all, what do you want? And I want you to begin to think about it. See, now I'm going to, so hey, praise God. Some of y'all already had that list ready. You're going to be 100. We're in church. We're going to keep it real. We already, you know, we have a list and there's more than 20 items on it. And uh, so, but I want to ask you a follow-up question on that. I got three questions really I'm going to ask with this is, what do you want? And now, why do you want it? slightly rhetorical at times, but why do you want it? And, and, and when I ask this question, because I think about, think about my uh, middle son, Nicolaus. He's four years old, and he's been pretty consistent with what he wants. He wants a remote, a remote controlled helicopter. He's four years old. He has no idea how to drive it. But he said the same thing for a few months now that he wants a remote control helicopter. And it's really neat. And, and, but I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, why do you want that? Like, like, and I tell him, you're four years old, you won't know how to drive it. It's a waste of money. Why do you want that? And, and I can only imagine what's going on in his insane four-year-old mind. Because I was also an insane four-year-old at one time. And I can think back when I was a kid about the toys that you'd see on commercials. How many of y'all know that commercials lie? Commercials lie. Like, how many of y'all not like Nerf guns? Yes, I know. We can ask that any time because they're amazing. And, and real talk, I'm going to use Nerf guns because they're awesome in and of themselves, right? But I remember being a kid and seeing some of the Nerf gun commercials, and it was crazy. Like, they're in a football stadium. I don't like football, but I like Nerf guns, and I like the stadium. And they're in the football stadium, and they're having a massive, massive, like, Nerf gun war. And you think, man, you get this Nerf gun, and, and you're going to be, like, deployed overseas, and you're going to have epic battles. Because these commercials, they build up unrealistic expectations so I think about she just got the joke from three minutes ago no <laughs> nah, but so, so they build up unrealistic expectations so I begin to think about my son and I imagine like you know he, he's, he wants this mercantile helicopter I imagine in his head he's like man I could fly it into my sister's room and shoot her while she's sleeping and, 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 and I, I could when I get told to clean up my stuff it'd like fly around I just sit on my bed and fly around pick everything up and I just imagine all these unrealistic expectations that he's attaching to it but then I, I throw the question back on us what do we want I think at times we have the commercial effect to the things that we desire as we begin to attach unrealistic expectations on the things that we begin to identify that we want. You see, when the way we can, we, we can dig into this is by asking ourselves, what does it offer us? If we're gonna, if we're gonna look at what, what we want and why we want it, I'm gonna ask the question, what does it offer us? And, and when we begin to think about it, man, like, like with my son, he probably thinks it's gonna be the end of him having to clean anything. And he's just going to fly. He probably thinks he can jump on top of that helicopter and fly around himself. And that would be awesome. If he can find one that does that, I might get it for me, not for him, but it would be fun. But, you know, you know, I think about, like, uh, like, man, like the Nerf guns. And I remember, like, the video games would come out. I love video games. I still do, and it's awesome. And you think, like, the new game is released, and, like, in your mind, it's like, if I can just get that one game, I don't need any other games. If I can just get that one game, I'll be happy. That's the only game I need for the system. I'll just play it back to back, and I'll never get tired of it. And it's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. And, and you begin to identify what you want. But then something crazy happens is you get it, and, like, oh, you know, a month later at best, you're tired of it. You already beat it. You're through it it's over y'all ever got something that you thought was going to be just epic and then those unrealistic expectations came crashing down you realize that's not really as good as what you thought it was going to be y'all ever order something at a restaurant and that happened oh. hey, man. <laughs> that's not even in the notes that's just because that's real right there sometimes you order something you think it's gonna be amazing you ever go to a restaurant with unrealistic expectations and you get your food and you're like yo we just wasted money i could have just gone home but that's that's unrelated but but it's real though you see, if we, base, if we base our happiness on temporal gains, then we operate in temporary happiness. I'm going to say it again. If we base our happiness on temporal gains, then we operate in temporary happiness. We need to begin to identify why it is we're asking for what we're asking for, what we think it's going to offer us, and then the ultimate question, how long is it going to last? Because if it's only going to last a little bit of time, then our happiness, the happiness that it gives us, is only going to make us happy for a little bit of time. Yeah. Amen? Y'all with me tonight? Yeah. We're going to be coming out of Haggai 1.6. I'm going to be reading from the message. And it says, take a good hard look at your life. Think it over. 
Literally, we could stop right there and just go home. We could, we could live with that one scripture for like a, a year. Just take a hard look at your life and think it over. You have spent a lot of money, but you haven't much to show for it. You keep filling your plates, but you never get full. You uh, keep drinking and drinking and drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put, on a, uh, you put on layer after layer of clothes, but you can't get warm. And the people who work for you, what are they getting out of it? Not much. A leaky, rusted out bucket. That's what. I'm going to hit it again. Take a good, hard look at your life. Think it over. You have spent a lot of money, but you haven't much to show for it. You keep filling your plates, but you never get filled up. You keep drinking and drinking and drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put on layer after layer of clothes, but you can't get warm. And the people who work for you, what are they, get, what are they getting out of it? Not much. A leaky, rusted out bucket, that's what. It's a heavy scripture. I think at Facebook, we can kind of take it and run with it. But I really want us to get this tonight. So I want us to dig into it. Like the Israelites are sitting there and they're like, man, we keep on acquiring. We keep on getting. What is this? It's a present. How many, how many of y'all like presents? Everyone should like, like presents. What's wrong with you if you don't like presents? Presents are good. And, and, but, but this was their mentality is they, kept on, is they kept on getting. They kept on getting money, but they didn't have anything to show for it. They kept on getting, man, food, but they were still hungry. Water and drink, but they were still thirsty. Clothes, but they were still cold. And the people that they were giving to, the people who worked for them, the people that they were blessing, what were they getting out of it? Nothing, because everything that they got went to a rusted out bucket. How many of y'all, look, that's like trying to put water in a strainer than drinking out of it. It doesn't work right. So they were getting all this stuff, and what would happen is they'd be like, man, do you see this? I got something else, and this is going to make me happy, and I'm going to be content in this. And, and this right here, you can't have it, but this right here, this is going to be what satisfies me. And they get it. You ever mess with people, you give them a gift, and they want to, like, gently tear off. Wrap that is wrapping paper. Please tear that. So they get it, and they just tear it off, and they're like, this is amazing. This is awesome. Look at it. I can't wait to show you. It's going to be so phenomenal. And they get it. They're like, oh, my gosh. You have so much stuff yes yes this is my house christmas day because of me not the kids and they got it like oh man this right here now that i have this i'm never gonna want anything else again now that i have this all of my needs will be met now that i have this i'm gonna be happy for the rest of my days nothing's gonna tear me down oh my gosh I <laughs> What? It's my gift. I should have washed it first. See, we settle for being pacified instead of being satisfied. Can I get an amen? Come on. We settle for being pacified in life. When we look at the stuff around us to judge if we can be happy or not, instead of being satisfied in life by looking at the source of our happiness. Amen. Do I need to suck on this some more? Can I throw this away? Are we done with that? <laughs> if the stuff around us is what makes us happy, then we're always going to need more. It doesn't matter what was in that box. If what I could fit in that box was going to make me happy, then it would never be enough. I would always need more. I already asked it, but you guys ever get something and then you realize that the expectations you attach to it come crumbling down and it's no longer enough to keep you happy and now you're just going out there for the next thing? And I'll make it a little bit, a little bit easier. How many of y'all got iPhones? The people who boo are the people who don't have them because they've never experienced the greatness of an iPhone. iPhone, you can send me one. You ever seen the lines for the new iPhones? You ever seen the lines for the new shoes? You ever seen the lines for, for any ridiculous possession that begins to possess us because we purchase it? How many of y'all realize that the stuff that we own begins to own us? Some of y'all are going to get that. That's an old reference from a movie. But the stuff that we own begins to own us. If we're looking for, 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 for the stuff around us, what we can accumulate to judge whether or not we're happy is never going to be enough because that new toy is eventually going to end up at the bottom of the closet. And that's literal or figurative. See, for adults, maybe we're not getting the new game system. You're doing it wrong if you're not. They're awesome. 
But maybe what we're looking for, maybe what we're designed for is that relationship. Maybe we're designed that that position at work, that that increase in our income, that man, that 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 family getting back together. Look, it doesn't have to be bad things that we're desiring. That's not the issue. Presents are good. Don't believe that I'm beginning to talk bad about getting gifts, get gifts, get give, give gifts to me. Um, but but that's not the issue. The issue is the unrealistic expectations that we place on those gifts. On that stuff. Philippians 4, 11, 12, out of the message again, see Paul begins to combat this concept that we have to have things to be happy and be content in our life. And he says, I've learned by now to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty, whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am again this is another scripture that we can take that that's it right there but I think it deserves something a little bit more you see Paul's offering a concept that we can apply today to begin to break the chains of our roller coaster life how many of y'all have ever heard of that expression of man, man life you know, feels like a roller coaster at times it's up and down and and you know I have good days and bad days and I've said it I've heard a lot of people say it too and, and I think in itself, it's not wrong. I just think our perspective is wrong because I've never gotten off of a roller coaster and been like, yeah, man, it had ups and downs, good days and bad days. No, you, you enjoy the ups and downs on a roller coaster. Otherwise, you're not getting on one. The loops, the twists, the turns, all of it. Some of it's scary, yeah, but you're still strapped in and having a good time. You throw your hands up and you act like you don't care because you're enjoying the ride. See, if we're going to start saying that our life is like a roller coaster with ups and downs and good days and bad days, then we're lying because it's not what the metaphor means, man. We need to begin to attach the perspective that our happiness doesn't come from what's going on around us but it comes from the ride that we're th- attached into which is the walk that we have with Christ because if we're latched in and we're strapped in and we keep our hands and feet inside the ride at all times we don't have anything to worry about we can go up and we can go down and we can loop and we can twist and the person in front of us may be throwing up but dude that's centrifugal force gonna keep it in their face and not mine and we're gonna have a good time so how many of y'all want that roller coaster life See, if you don't want the roller coaster life, then you're going to be very disappointed because that's called life. Life has ups and downs. It has ins and outs. Paul's not saying that in his relationship with Christ, you know, he's found the recipe to make sure that everything goes his way. This is Philippians. He's writing in jail. He's saying, he's saying, look, I know what it is to have a lot and to have a little, to have my hands full and my hands empty, to be on the mountain high in victory and the valley low in defeat. I know what it's like, but none of those things are what determine if I'm going to be content or not in life. See, is your quality based on your quantity? We give the church answer to say, no, I, I'm happy no matter what I have. I, you know, I've eaten, I've eaten ramen and PB and J and. And, 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 and I've, I've eaten prime rib and, 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 and expensive whatever. I don't care. We can give the church an answer. But to be honest, let me present it this way. It is your quality attached to your quantity? And let me say this. If you lost your job today, if you lost your house today, your car today, your food today, your, man, your clothes, you're going to lose your clothes. I'm going to give you one outfit. It's going to be itchy. You lost everything, your friends, your family. Are you still going to be like, I'm happy? Could it be real? No, we're not. But to be real, this is what Paul was facing. He lost everything and still was like, yo, I can be content in my life because my quality is not based on my quantity. The quantity, the stuff that's around me does not determine whether or not my quality of my relationship with Christ is going to become hindered. Say, man, we could lose everything and no, you know, we're, to be honest, we're not going to be happy. We're going we're gonna to deal with it for a minute. We're probably going to come into the church and be like, man, everything around me is falling apart. My, it feels like the world has just flipped upside down and, and, and I, I just don't know which way is up. We're going to feel like the, 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 walls are, the walls are crumbling around us. How many of y'all ever felt like your very foundation is being, just being shook and you can't even stand up? See, the, the, the fact is, is that in life, man, we're going to lose stuff. Man, we're, we're going to lose finances, we're going to lose jobs, we're going to lose houses, cars, I don't, but we, we can lose it all. Nothing is guaranteed. Yeah. Right. So again, nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. But the thing is, is our foundation doesn't have to be in connection to the stuff that we're building in our life. When our foundation, when, when the stuff around us begins to fall apart, it doesn't have to affect our foundation. Unless 
we've used that stuff to build our foundation. See, Paul's mindset is he didn't use that stuff to build his foundation. He didn't use the quantity of stuff that he had in his life to determine whether or not he could be happy and lay that kind of foundation. He said, no, I found the recipe for happiness and it's not found in the stuff that's around me. It's found in something bigger. So I found the recipe of being happy. If, we're to, if you were to write a recipe of happiness, what would your recipe look like? Could you even write one? The recipe is important because Paul's not offering a, a, an, an instant fix. He's not offering a, uh, man, praise God, he's not offering like a one-time thing. Like, you, you know someone in the kitchen who can just go in the kitchen with random stuff and just make something that's awesome, but, but they can't make it again because they just kind of did everything on the fly? And he's like, like I, I've eaten food with people and be like, yo, that was so good. Like, how'd you make it? And they're like, I don't know. I just, you know, this and that. They can't do it again. And if they do, it's a fluke. You can't do it again. So, like, just, just, you know, just one person having a good life and finding a way to be content no matter how much you have, that's not that beneficial. Just one person. You know, if they, they just happen to, you know, fall into the, you know, easy street. That's not beneficial. But Paul's not saying that. He said that he found the recipe. What's also bad is a re- uh, with a recipe is you can recreate a recipe. See, like, people hate on chain restaurants, but, like, Outback's one of my favorite places to go to your steak. You know why? Because I can go to Outback here or I can go to Outback and, like, uh, Canada, I'm assuming they have them. And my steak's going to taste the same because they all follow the same recipe. And that means that my recipe, that Paul's recipe for the good life, for happiness, no matter the issues going on around him, will work for me as long as I follow the recipe, right? And if it works for me, that means it's going to work for you too if you follow the recipe, right? So a recipe, but you know, so if I was going to ask you to begin to outline your recipe for happiness, what would you begin to write down or do you have anything to write down? But I want I want you to keep in mind that a recipe is influenced by its ingredients. The quality of ingredients that we use in our recipe is going to determine the product. I was talking to a Mr. Lachine today, Cafe Lachine, woo-woo, food's always good. And, uh, and we were talking about this type of bread. I don't know the bread. And last time I pronounced something that he did, I said it wrong. I'm not going to do that again. But we were talking about this bread. And he was talking about, uh, and he was talking about how, like, man, it takes like six hours to do something. You got to wait six hours before you can eat it. That's too long for me. I want it faster than that. We got to wait time to get it. He was like, you know, that or we can just order off the food truck and have it ready right away. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool, man. So, like, have you ever done, like, a side-by-side taste test? You prepare it the same way and side-by-side. And, 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 and like, if you did that, would you be able to tell the difference? He's like, yeah, absolutely. Slightly pretentious, but it's okay. I was like, well, you cook for a living, so would the average person be able to taste the difference? But he said something, and, and uh, it was actually really cool. Not that I was surprised by him saying something cool, but it was really cool. Praise God. I love you, man. And uh, he, said, he said, they may not know what exactly is different, but they're going to know something's different. I think that's so true, man. It's the same thing, but it's different. I think a lot of us, man, in our walks with Christ, you know, we're we're trying to live out the recipe, but we're using the wrong ingredients. We're trying to live out this recipe, but, you know, and it looks somewhat the same. We come to church, man, we're we're Sundays and Wednesdays, and we're praying, and we we might even join a a small group, and we're we're serving, and we're doing this, and the, uh, the person next to us, they're doing this. They have horrible news hit home, and they're fine. We have horrible news, and it feels like everything's falling apart. Same recipe, but the ingredients are different. The question is, where are we getting our ingredients from? See, Paul's explaining that his recipe doesn't, doesn't involve ingredients that can be found around him or accumulated. It's not about the stuff that's around him. It, it, he's getting his ingredients from something else. You see, his ingredients are coming from a deeper place, and a lot of y'all probably already picking up on it. His ingredients don't come from him having a lot or him having a little. His ingredients come from the quality of his relationship with God. His ingredients are, 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 are from the relationship that he has with Christ and the foundation that he's laid, and that's going to be crucial. So I'm going to ask you this, you know, because our ingredients determine what we're cooking. I'm going to ask you, what are you cooking? Ask your neighbor, what are you cooking? Ask your other neighbor, man, what are you cooking? <laughs> ask him like you're hungry, man, what are you cooking? You Esau hungry, you ready to change, you trade your birthright for it, what are you cooking? See, some people are probably thinking, man, you know, look, look, Pastor Nick, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I don't need this. I already have the right recipe. I already, I already got the recipe. I read my word and I do what I'm supposed to be doing and, and, I, and I'm in church right now. I could have just stayed home and I could have actually cooked a real dinner instead of being late for dinner tonight because I came to church, especially to hear something that I already know about. Talk to me about a recipe. <laughs> Can't even cook. <laughs> <laughs> 
See, but uh, you ever seen those Facebook videos, like the 60 second ones, and they're, showing, and they're, they're showing them cooking like crazy stuff? I saw one, it's my favorite, this, I'm going to throw this out there. They got like prime rib, but it's not like the prime rib I get. It's in a chuck, it's like in a roast, and they cook it, and then they slice it, and it looks like heaven. And it's amazing, right? And you can click on the link, and, and, and you know what they give you? They give you a what? They give you a recipe, right? So <laughs> they give you the recipe. So the thing is, is yeah, you may be sitting in church tonight and think that you got the recipe, but I've come to find something now. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, praise God, the recipe isn't the issue, it's the execution. Sometimes we can have the recipe, but it's the execution where we mess it up. My wife and I, we like watching cooking shows, and she just put me onto this one that we finished up. It was Zumbo's Just Dessert. Which is an awesome name because it works on two levels because he owns a dessert shop and just dessert is a phrase, whatever. But it's an awesome show and it's a competition cooking show and they're baking desserts. And it's really neat because the two lowest ranking people in each, in each episode, they have to compete against each other to see who stays. And the way they compete is he brings out one of his signature desserts and they show it to him and it looks amazing and I want to eat my TV. And then they're given like 17 pages of the recipe and their job is to recreate the dessert. And you think, though, like, when I first started, I was like, man, they're all cooks. Why can't they just follow the recipe and make it work? But to be honest, it proved a lot more difficult than it was. Yeah. See, some of us have the right recipe, but we just don't seem to follow it. Man, we, we switch up the ingredients. We think, man, I, this really isn't that important, so I'm going to add this in instead. You know, I don't, I don't really need to do this step, so I'm going to skip it. And, and, like, my wife's real big on this. You know, you, know, you know what you're supposed to cook stuff on in the oven? 400, everything is 400. I'm, little, I'm not arguing she's a great cook, but everything's 400. I'm like, babe, it says 325. She said, no, nah, I'll be done faster. I'll watch it, sweetie. I'm like, okay, I don't have to cook it. I'll eat it. But like, everything's 400. So we begin to, man, we take shortcuts, right? And with food, it's fine. With life, not so much. Because what will happen is when these people begin to take shortcuts and missteps in the recipe, they begin to, uh, they begin to uh, um, skip stuff and, and not add in the right ingredients or switch up the seasonings by either by accident or intentionally. And then they have to go present it to the judge. And what happens is like, dude, this doesn't taste anything like it was supposed to. Some of them are melting and falling apart. And some of them can't even be plated, which is when you take it and you put it on the actual plate to present to the judge. And some of us in our lives... We begin to plate ourselves to present to the judge and we're going to find out that our recipe wasn't really followed and a lot of our ingredients aren't right. And he's going to say, look, you are claiming to be what I called you to be, but you don't taste anything like what you were supposed to taste like. We can't skip steps in the recipe. We can't take shortcuts. In the recipe, we have to follow the recipe because if we find happiness in anything else, if we find the ability to be content in anything less, if we try to find satisfaction in what the world has to offer us, it's just like that pacifier. Yeah. That'll keep us subdued for a little while. You ever given a baby, a crying baby, a pacifier, and they take it and they shut up? I mean, I mean, they go to sleep. They shut up, man. Baby, shut up. That's what they do. And then they wake back up and they're crying again. It works for a little bit of time. It'll keep you quiet for a little bit of time, but it's not going to satisfy you. Paul says, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. I'm going to say that again. I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. My recipe is not formed based on what the world has to offer me. My recipe is found in the one who makes me who I am, the creator of me. You could pull out your identity card, your, your, your driver's license, your state issue, whatever you got, and you can read your name, and that is who you are. I don't care what your nickname is, what your screen name is, how I got to find you on Facebook, or what your friends call you, your mom calls you, or what you call yourself. Your name is on that card. That's your identity. And Paul's saying, look, my recipe for happiness is found in acknowledging the fact that God created me with an identity that's not given to me by the world. And if I find myself in him, then my happiness will be found in him and not in what happens in life. So that means when the world's falling down around me and everything's coming apart, yeah, life can suck at times and it can be difficult, but it's not going to affect my happiness in God. When the, you know, tis the season, uh, I, I began looking this up. It's like tis the season for, you know, to be jolly. Tis the, I don't know who says jolly anymore. I think I look at you, stranger. Are you jolly today? 
Yeah, so how you doing? I'm jolly. I'm like, oh, you, you need to go home? You okay? You need some Pepto-Bismol or something? I don't know what's going on. You know, it is the season to be, to be grateful. It is the season to be, you know, to, to, to be happy, to be whatever you want to add in there. There's a positive word. But to be honest, if we look to the world to determine when we can be content, when we can be satisfied, when we can be happy, it is only a season. Because eventually it's going to wear off and we're going to spit the pacifier out. And begin looking for the next thing. But he says, I can go through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Our satisfaction is based on the substance of its source. Which again, our satisfaction is based on the substance of its source. Think about this. If you had a fireplace and and, and that was your only source of heat, you better keep logs in that fire. If your happiness is found in what the world has to offer, if your satisfaction is found in the stuff that you accumulate around you, if you look outward to feel something inward, then what you're going to find is it's always, it's all, you're always going to reach a limit. It's always going to run out. It's finite. It's material stuff. No matter what you have, it goes away. You begin to lose interest. You, it begins to not meet the need anymore. I can think back in my own life, start with finances, where, where I've, been, I've, had, I've made less money than what I make now. And, and, and at that time, I'd be like, man, I wish I had more money. Then now, uh, even though I make more money, I still have the mindset, man, I wish I made more money. Can anyone relate to that? Great. Be honest in church tonight. And what's funny is I had someone tell me something. I probably shared it before, but he said, the more money you make, the more money you'll need to make. And that makes a lot of sense when our happiness is based on the stuff that we accumulate around us. But when we begin to accept the fact that God is a source, then we begin to realize that him him as a source is unlimited. He's infinite. His supply doesn't run out. He, he, he's never going to reach a, a bound or a barrier that he can't overcome. So that means that no matter what we're going through, he's always going to be bigger. He's a, the foundation that we lay with him is always going to be stronger. We're never going to you know, get to a point where we're like, God, I got to go through this. And God looks back and is like, yeah, I ain't got anything else. I'm tapped out. You got to go somewhere else. He doesn't do that. But when we base it on the world, that's what the world is going to do. But if we begin to step into the light that God's called us to step into, the identity that God's called us to live, out then we're going to begin to uh we're going to begin to find our satisfaction in him and the substance of that relationship the substance of that uh, of that abundance the source of it is god the substance is never going to run out we can't reach a point with christ in our walk that we can face an issue that he can't allow us to overcome have you ever felt as you find yourself in a situation where, where you truly feel like god there's no way out of this and at the last minute god finds you a way out of this now, have you, ever, have you ever reached another situation like a month later and you're saying the same thing? God's like, dude, I just showed you. I can already make a way out. But God, God is a God of abundance. He's a God that continues to pour out in us. He's a God that keeps, man, and he keeps us still in a world that is constantly changing. God's a, God's a God that's going to meet us right where we're at and not leave us short and not leave us uh, 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 shorthanded. He's never going to leave us lacking. He's never going to say, wow, this is a really screwed up situation. Have fun with that. But if we if we look to the stuff around us and that stuff can break and that stuff, can you think, man, God, I just just want a car that's going to be reliable. And you get a car and it's reliable, then it just breaks. You you, you get a job and you think it's going to be enough and then it's not enough anymore. You get that relationship that you wanted and you realize it's not what you thought it was going to be. When we begin to put stuff inside of a box and think think that whatever's inside of this box is going to be enough for us to make it through life, then we're going to quickly find out that we had unrealistic expectations attached to what we could fit inside of a box because it's not enough. But when we begin to step into the identity that God created us for, you see, God's not, it's not like we're coming to God and it's like, God, I'm going to choose you out of all the religions. Well, no, it's not like that. It's like, God, I'm choosing you because you're the author and finisher of everything. That, that you created this everything, all, all matter, God, you create it. So I'm not just worshiping some random thing. I'm worshiping the only thing that really matters. And we begin to go back to him and him who created us with an identity, him who created us with a purpose and a plan. He created you to live something out in your life. And it's not to constantly be in need or constantly be lacking. It's, it's to find your place. God to find your satisfaction and your ability to be content in your relationship with him. Amen. We're not supposed to look out to see. Uh, we're not supposed to look out to judge how we feel inside, because if we look out, then we're constantly going to be changing how we feel inside. 
We're supposed to look inward to begin to see how we're going to feel inside. And I say to look inward not because it's in and of ourselves, but it's because Holy Spirit's inside of us. Yeah. And when the living Spirit of God is what's inside of us, then it doesn't matter what we are going through because the living Spirit of God is going to call us to abide in joy. And when we abide in joy, hell can be going on around us. And for some weird reason, we're still going to be able to smile and laugh. You ever laughed in the face of hell going on around you? You ever, you ever, you ever been to be lighthearted about bad news? Uh, I, I, man, man, I, I just got fired and my, my, you know, my, my significant other, they're not working and everything. I'm like, man, be excited. You're in Christ, right? Yeah, I believe, man, me and God, we got, a, I hear this thought, we got an understanding. Me and God, we got an understanding. I pray and we got an understanding. I said, man, I don't think you understand. It's not supposed to be like that. You don't have an understanding with God. You have a relationship with God as your Lord and your Savior, as your master over your life. That is about his will. And look, if God calls you to not have a job and you, and you don't have a job because you're doing what he's calling you to do, you're not called to worry about that job. You're not called to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow when you're living your life for what God's called you to live your life for. If we're walking according to the plan that he's paid for us, it's not our responsibility to figure out the details. It's our responsibility to be obedient to him and do what he's called us to do. If we begin to walk the path that he's called us to walk we need to stop looking at the path and start focusing on him and when we do that it doesn't matter what the path looks like we're still going to be content and satisfied in the situation because our content our ability to be content and our satisfaction isn't going to be found on the path that's going to be found on the relationship paul was content because he didn't he didn't rely on the uh, quantity of stuff but the quality of his identity His identity was found in Christ, and the quality of that identity will determine if you can make it through hell and high water without being shook at the foundation. It's not just the identity, because if I ask you, are you, you know, okay, here you go. Women, are you a daughter of God? Yes. Women, are you a daughter of God? Yes. Gentlemen, are you the sons of God? Yes. Amen. Not about the noise that you make, it's about the quality of the relationship. I can say that I'm married, but if I never spend time with my wife, if I never commune with her, if I never talk with her, if I never hang out with her, if I don't build with her, if I don't grow with her, if I don't develop and progress with her, then our relationship, just the fact that I'm married to her doesn't mean anything. And I'm probably, I'm pretty sure it's going to be short lived. It's not just about the noise that we can make. It's about the quality of the time and effort that we put into that relationship. If we're moving forward in that relationship with God, and if we can really build that, that foundation with him as our, as our center, and we can really lay ourselves down. Lay ourselves down and submit to who he is over our life, then we're going to begin to produce quality. And when we begin to produce quality, we can sit in the same, in the same shoes as Paul. You can be chained up with poop halfway to your waist and, and just, just overcome with defeat. At least that's what the word would say. But then you can look at it and say, yo, look, they thought they were going to mess up my ministry. They've only made it better. Now I get to minister to the guards who are guarding me. But it's based on the quality of our relationships. So if you find yourself on that roller coaster and it's not the happy one with your hands in the air and the funny photo at the top, but, but, but it's the one where you're crying and screaming the whole way when it's going down and then you're rejoicing really loud when it's going up and, and you find yourself in that situation, what you need to evaluate isn't what's going on around you, it's what's going on inside of you. What's the quality of your relationship? And I'm going to close with this. See, our, identif- our identity will reflect our ability to ex- execute the recipe. I'll say it again. Our identity will reflect our ability to execute the recipe, the recipe for happiness, for satisfaction, for the recipe to be content no matter what what, what in the world is going on around us. Our identity is going to reflect if we can actually execute. I know that if if I make something and I write down all the steps, I can give it to Justin. He can make the same thing. He probably won't because he says it's nasty, but he can make the same thing because he's a chef. That's what he does. So I'm going to ask you, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? How many of y'all love Jesus? So if I give you a recipe, can you execute it? Okay, maybe not for me. If Paul gives you a recipe, can you execute it? Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, God, man, he was, exec- he was executing Christians, and God called him out of that, and he began to proclaim the gospel to the, uh, to the Gentiles. Paul, who was, man, used to shape and change the world through Holy Spirit, if he gave you a recipe that would allow you to not be, man, so shifted and so, and, and, and it's a concept of being a, te- uh, being a thermometer or a thermostat, and we use that a lot in the Christian world, but it's so true. When it gets hot outside, is your, tem- is your thermometer going up? When it's cold outside, is your 
thermometer going down or are you the one making it hot or cold? Your identity isn't called to be shifted by what's going on around you. Your identity is called to shift what's going on around you. And when we begin to walk in that identity, then we can execute the recipe and we can make this beautiful thing called happiness even when we're chained up. Even when we feel like everything's falling apart. What's the source of your identity? Is it Jesus? And I don't want you to answer this one because I want you to think about it. Is it your relationship with Jesus? Or is it your relationship with the stuff that you've accumulated around you? And I'm going to say this, before you answer it to yourself and brush it off, just like any other question, if you lost everything around you, would you still rejoice? See, because Paul calls us to rejoice always. And then I say rejoice, even when you're doing good and even when you're doing bad. And even when you feel like everything's falling apart, I'm calling you to rejoice because that's our identity. Holy Spirit, the living Spirit of God is inside of us and we're called to abide in joy. Abide is a dwelling place like a house or a house or tabernacle for Holy Spirit. The temple that our body is for Holy Spirit is supposed to be one of joy. So if you lost everything around you, would you still have joy? And would you show it? We have to get our identities right so that we can we can break, man, we can shake off the cycle of, of being really good and then falling back, of, you know, doing really good and then doing bad, of, of our walks backsliding. This is a source of all of that, our walks backsliding where we, man, we're on fire for God and then we fall apart again. That's because our walk is being based on what's going on around us instead of what God's doing inside of us. So if we can begin to let go of all of that and begin to hold on to the only thing that matters, which is him who created us, then everything else will work itself out. Father God, we praise you and we thank you. God, we ask that, that, that in, indeed, in this time of year, we can rejoice. We can celebrate friends and family, God. We can give gifts out of love and we can receive them with smiles, God. But we also ask that, that the greatest gift that we receive is our identity and that's given, uh, given to us by you. God, that you begin, to, you begin to siphon out all the stuff that we don't need in our lives, all the stuff that distracts us, God. Anything that we think is dependent on us being happy and satisfied, I ask, God, that you begin to strip it from us so that our happiness and satisfaction is only going to be based in you. And when it's only based in you, God, it doesn't matter. If all hell is breaking out, uh, breaking all, breaking out around us, we're still going to be happy and satisfied. God, we're not promised a, a perfect, easy life. But we are promised a perfect God who's going to love us through thick and thin and be with us and never leave us nor forsake us. A God who's going to be with us when the world's falling apart and when it's all celebrations and good times. A God that's not going to leave us high and dry or say that he's tapped out. But a God that's going to provide our every need and be there as a, as a resource for us. God that's never going to leave us down and out. God, but that's going to build us back up. And God, when we find ourselves faking, facing obstacles that are overwhelming, we can, we can laugh at those obstacles because we serve an overwhelming God. We serve a God that's going to be bigger than any situation that we're facing. A God who's going to take us from point A to point B no matter what's going on in between. A God who's not going to leave us the same but continue to build us up and develop us the longer that we work with him and walk with him. A God that's about quality and not quantity and the quality of our relationship is going to be formed through our dedication God, through our worship, through our prayer, through our time reading the Bible, through our fellowship God that we can continue to develop and be formed in you. Your grace is there for us when we fall down and your grace is what picks us back up to be able to turn from it and keep on walking god we need you in this life for today and for tomorrow and for every other day god because our identity is found in you so whatever the situation is that people are dealing with right now because i know that we're a church full of people living real lives dealing with real problems having to go through real circumstances having real issues god i ask that they begin to lay them down lay them down to you and in, the, in that, God, they're laying themselves down and saying that your will be done. Your will over the situation and over their lives. That they begin to truly submit to who you are. And that means letting go of what they think should happen and just holding on to who you are. And letting you, letting you figure out all the details. What's so awesome with this identity is that we, if we're not in Christ now, we can step into him. We can receive the identity that he created us to live out. And it's no, it's no complicated measures. It's no getting things right first. It's not that we have to shake off sin or, or stop this or stop that. It's just that we have to receive the love that he has for us. 
That's just by opening our hearts and receiving him and, and, and admitting to him that, yeah, I've fallen and I can't do this on my own. I'm sinful and I need a savior to take away that sin. And, and I need one who's going to walk with me every day through the whole process. And we're going to say a prayer, not because you have to, because all you got to do is profess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, but because it helps people. So we're going to have the whole church say it with us. But, but if, it's your, if it's you and you're in that situation, you're saying that you're tired of having that bad roller coaster ride in life, the ups and the downs, and, and, and feeling like one day you're doing great and the next day you're doing horrible, and, and you just feel like you can't get a handle on things, and your foundation's falling apart, and when you think you're standing firm the next day, man, you're, you're flat on your face again. If you're tired of that, then what I'm going to encourage you to do is to take a, take a step of faith. Receive Christ. Admit to him that you're broken and you need him. That you can't handle it, but he, but, but, but he can. And begin to submit your life to him and watch what he does. So I'm going to say the prayer. We're going to repeat it, but if it's you, you believe it. Say it as your own. Father God, we praise you. Thank you for saving us. I'm sinful. I've fallen, and I can't handle it on my own. God, I need you. Jesus, I need you. The sacrifice on the cross that paid for my sin, that reconciled me back into your presence. I need you every day. Holy Spirit, I need you to lead God and direct me. Teach me. Correct me. Encourage me. Show me my true identity. God, I need your happiness, your satisfaction. I need to be content in the quality of my relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Can you all stand